Alrighty, shalom everybody. Welcome to Baruch B'Shem Yeshua. We're, this week we're going over this week's Torah portion, which is Parshas Tzav. And we're doing something new. We are um, not only putting these uh, Torah portion teaching videos on Rumble, but we are also taking the audio version and putting them on the Baruch B'Shem Yeshua podcast as well. So you can get it in a ton of different ways. All right. So um, that's exciting, I think. I think it is, at least. It may not be to you. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and get started into this week's Torah portions of. Now, I ended up going and looking at uh, the Chomish. And upon going and looking at the Chomish, I, I, I circled something here. Let's go ahead and read the verse, first of all. Zav et Aharon vi et banav lemor zot torat haola he haola al mokda al mokda. That's important. Al hamizbeach kol haleila ad haboker viesh hamizbeach tukad bo. Now, this word over here that we have circled, mokda, what's interesting about that? We have a suspended mem, and it is smaller. This is something we saw in the last Torah portion as well. We saw a textual anomaly like this, and these are not textual anomalies that come up in every single Torah portion. And right here we have it in the word mokda. Now, what exactly is Emokta. What is that? What is this thing that you speak of? Well, it's this thing right over here. The thing that you see right here on top of the altar where all of this stuff is burnt up. You know, many, you know, um, I think many English translations has it as the hearth. It's like, what, what, what is that? Is that King James English? What is that? What is a hearth? Well, it's uh, it's it's this thing right here. This is the mokda, okay? So, it's interesting because when seeing this, the first thing I do is I go to Bahatarim. Bahatarim is looking at all the textual anomalies within that of the Hebrew. Bahatarim doesn't say anything about this. Or Chaim doesn't say anything about this. There is nothing written about this in the Godnik Homish. There's nothing written about this in the um, in terms of the footnotes within of the Targumim. There is nothing in the footnotes of so many of the different commentary texts that it is that I have. I had to go digging to try and find some answers of to why this is. And it seems that um, the sages are wondering, I, I don't know. Don't know why this is. But we do have this over here from... From Emes Viamuna Katsur. And it says within here the daily burnt offering was sacrificed Al Mokda on the fireplace of the altar in Leviticus 6 2. Mokda is written with a small mem to teach us that ecstasy in serving God should burn in the heart but not be exhibited in public. Now, there's something in terms of the Torah that deals with this very thing. And it is the mitzvahs for men to wear zitzu. The thing that you'll notice is that most Jewish men what they will do is they will wear a talikatan. In the shul, they may wear a talikadol. When in prayer, they'll wear a talikadol. But whenever you are in prayer um, within that of, uh, you know, hepatodot or something like that, you're in seclusion. People aren't seeing this. Okay? The thing that is interesting with the talikatan, the talikatan is the kosher way to wear zitzio. Okay? 
And basically, for those of you who don't know, it's like an undershirt. And then you have the four corners of the undershirt. And those four corners, you have the white ZCO that come through through there. Now, if you are a very wealthy individual, you may be able to afford to hell it. To hell it is not necessarily a color. Maybe people are like, oh, just take it straight into blue. Put that. It's like, no, that's not the way it works. Um, to hell it is it, it, the color is indeed blue, but however, is the material on which it's made out of it comes from a specific dye that comes from either a fish or a snail. And it's very pricey because of the fact that these two animals are endangered. So it's really hard to go and get actual to kill it. And so you have these, but the whole thing is that a majority, 90% of the document, and that's my uh, Dexcom going off, my blood sugar is high in case anybody's wondering, okay, I got my shot, so I'm good. But a 90% of the garment is underneath the clothing. It is not where it is seen. And the only thing that is seen are the little bits that are coming out from the four corners at the bottom where the zitzayot come down from. This, this is a commandment specifically for men because the commandment is B'nai Yisrael as opposed to Banot Yisrael. Okay, this is men's garb, not women's garb. And so the thing is that this is something that we should know about in our daily life anyway, in terms of walking out the Torah, that a majority of mitzvot that are fulfilled are not done for praying eyes. It's not, oh, look at what I do. You know, look at me keeping kosher. Look at me doing Shabbos. Look at me doing this. Look at how important I am. Look at how much more holy I am. That type of individual, as you've heard about on this program, as we talked about, is the antithesis of fulfilling mitzvot of the Torah. It's the antithesis of it. It basically goes to take something that is good and turns it into something that's evil because it's done for self-promotion. The thing is that we are supposed to walk in humility through everything that it is that we've done in our life, and a majority of our mitzvahs are fulfilled in a person's bayis. They are fulfilled in a person's home, and it is challenged in the realm of marriage. And the thing is that, you know, with that, when you have the the concept of shalom bayis, you know, the thing is that it's taught within Judaism that the woman brings the shalom to the bayis, to the home, and it's the man's job to keep it. And the thing is that us men, we operate on a different wavelength than women. They are much more spiritual than us. They're on a higher mandrega. Us men are very literal and analytical. And, uh, you know, the thing is that, you know, you take those two things, you know, there's going to be a little bit of clash at times. But the thing is, the, f the fulfillment of mitzvahs and being able to go and have your wife's honor and her vitality grow and stay with her through that of a marriage is the fulfillment of mitzvahs. And it's done in secret. It is done away from prying eyes. It's not, it's not like you go and you update your social media status and you're like, oh, you know what? Came home. My wife is really happy today. I, this is all because of me. You know, I, and when a person goes and says, I do Shabbos, I go and I keep kashrut and all these things, this is essentially the exact same thing. They're, they're parallels of one another, and people see that, and they're like, well, what an egotistical jerk. You know, how in the world can this individual's wife put up with this nonsense, with this egotism and all that? So, you know, the thing is that that is a huge part of what this little mem symbolizes within the Parshas, why it is suspended and is small. But there's also a little bit more in there because it's very interesting that all of the great sages didn't really speak on this. This is the one source that we could find on this premise. There's something that also came to mind as well, that the whole time that this is being talked about, what we are going through here is the carbonate, the offerings to Hashem. This is what is being talked about within the Parshas and all throughout this entire Sefer of Vayikra, of Leviticus. This is something that's, this is what this entire book is basically about. 
But it's interesting because we have this concept of the Korban talked about over and over again throughout this Sefer that deals with the rectification of the individual, of a person, you know, um, being at unity with Hashem, rectifying their sin, all of these things are things that are encapsulated within the bloodiest book of the Bible, which is the book of Vaikra. And so the thing is that the Mem symbolizes the word Mashiach. It symbolizes that. Now, it's very interesting that Mashiach, as we see in Isaiah 53, we just did a teaching on Isaiah 53 yesterday, by the way, go and check that out, um, about Mashiach being a korban, being a korban, taking our sin upon himself, and him being a korban to Hashem. And so that's a very interesting part of this whole thing, because the thing that's interesting is something I'll be talking about next week in responding to the anti-missionaries, is that in Isaiah chapter 9, there's a closed mem in the word le marbe. The mem has two forms. It has this regular form and it has a sofit form. Okay, And the thing that is interesting about that is be considering that Isaiah 7, Isaiah 7, 14, is one of the prominent proofs of the Messiahship of Yeshua. And the anti-missionaries will, you know, and, I, and I'm not going to get too much into that teaching because we're going to cover that. But, you know, they, they leave out Isaiah 9 where we have the word Le Marbe. And what the sages say in terms of that is like, why is there a mem sofit in Le Marbe? It's done incorrectly. Why is this? And they're like, oh, well, it's because of the fact that it represents a closed womb, which is the sofit form of the mem, which is closed, you know, that is moved to the middle. And it only and the sofit form is only supposed to be at the end. It's never in the middle. That's, you know, something that is dealt with with the sofit forms of Hebrew letters, that they have a different form. And so it's very interesting that just the explaining of that and the fact that mem represents Mashiach and there's two forms of the mem. There is the one that is at the beginning the middle, and then there's a different one at the end that, you know, kind of parallels the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering servant Messiah. And it's very interesting that this mem in this passage in Vayikra 6.2 is a little mem that is suspended. It's a little humble mem. And then we have the final form that represents that of Mashiach ben David of the final form of the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah. So all of these things play into, I think, into this little suspended mem. And maybe it is that this is why it is that Rashi says nothing about this. Why Baha'tarim says nothing about this. Why or Orhechaim says nothing about this. And so on. Who knows? Who knows? But it, it, it's it's a very important premise here. But we got a little bit more that we're going to go over in this Parsha as well. We're going to go to Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 7, verses 26 through 27. It says in there, you should not eat any blood in any of the places where you live, whether from birds or from animals. But the blood of the fish and the grasshoppers is permitted if any person eats any blood the soul of that person will be cut off from his people. Now, it's very interesting because within that of Acts chapter 15, it says that one of the things that you start out doing is not eating blood. Making sure that your meat doesn't have blood in it. You don't eat that stuff. You don't do it. Why? Why is this the first thing that happens? Well, because there's so many mitzvahot that are within that. Because this deals with the concept of kosher slaughter. The, the way that a kosher slaughter happens is many people say, well, you know, a rabbi goes and prays over it, all that stuff that it's kosher. No, no, that's not the, that's not the case at all. In order for something to be kosher, you're getting it confused with the uh, with the Muslims if that's what you think it is. But, you know, with um, an actual kashrot, that actual kosher slaughter, the 
there is a knife known as a shechet, and the shechet is supposed to be double the length of the neck of the animal. And it has to be so sharp that when the neck of the animal is cut, it, it starts to bleed out, doesn't even know it's dying. It doesn't even feel that it. it's so sharp. And you can only swipe the neck one time. If you have to do it a second time, it's no longer kosher. It, because what's going to happen is that means that the animal had felt that that had happened. It is not bleeding out. So therefore, it's going to tense up. And when you go and you tense up, what happens to your blood? Well, you know, if you were having your blood seep out, then the blood will be getting into, you know, the flesh and all that stuff. It would kind of be soaking into those fleshy portions. And so that's that's a key part of kosher slaughter is that there's no blood in it. And it's not that there was blood and then it was taken out and so on and so forth. Um but however, there is an instance where if that is the case, that it is talked about. And it's something that comes up in our very next slide here. And this is from Lekote Halachot. Okay. It says the blood of an animal contains its animalistic soul. A person who eats the blood will bring the animalistic soul into his own body. Therefore, one must first remove the blood by salting the meat. Salt corresponds to the sadic and a guard guarded covenant. When a person guards his covenant in purity, he cleanses his blood system from the animalistic tendencies. One of the things that also happens within that of a kosher slaughter is that the animal is indeed dipped in to salt to dry out anything that is within there as well okay now this is a lot different than going to the to the grocery store getting something that's not kosher and saying okay i'm just gonna put a bunch of something put it in salt water and all that stuff you could do that if you have to but only if it is that you don't have the option because you're going to get some of that blood seeped into the meat and all that stuff but the animalistic soul, it's very interesting that Rabbi Nachman of Breslev goes and brings this up because when you look at the laws of B'nai Noach and you look at the commandments that were given to the children of Israel as they are starting out in Acts chapter 15, every single thing here deals with negating the animalistic soul. Okay, the ways of the animal, the things of lust, the things of, you know, that are a part of the fleshy nature of a person, that these are the things that must be stripped away from a person because all of these things is very much in many ways seen as a psychological thing. Because first of all, you have to kill your Yetzirah, which is that animalistic soul, that animalistic instinct. You look at the way that an animal operates. The animal does what he does to survive it's because it's all that he knows. You know, that's why an animal does what it is that, that he does. But see, the thing is that we are supposed to be of that of a higher soul than that of an animal. So therefore, we have to shed that fleshly desire. We have to shed that animalistic soul. And that is what the laws of B'nai Noach, and the thing is, the laws in chapter 15 of Acts are the laws of B'nai Noach. The other three that aren't mentioned were a part of secular law. So the thing is, the laws of B'nai Noach were even told to be done by the people who start out in their walk. But see, the thing is that it goes and talks about the salt and the covenant and all these things within the words of Rebbe Nachman of Breslev. And the thing is that we see a parallel within that of Brit Tadashah of the New Testament by the words of the Rebbe Melech HaMashiach Yeshua HaNotzri, who says that to be the salt of the earth, to draw out the things that make something not kosher is essentially what he's saying. To be that salt, to draw those things out, to disperse those things away from you, to have those things be shown. You know, it's it was on the inside of the animal, and then all of a sudden it's up there on the it's you know, all the way to the surface. It can be seen, and then it is quickly discarded. It's not, hey, look, go and look at that. Look at that. Look, 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 look. No, it's going discarded. It's not needed. Bye bye. So, you know, just so you know, Yeshua is not talking about exposures and all that stuff. That's not what, you know, to draw out those things. That's not what he's meaning. It's, it's, it's an entire premise of purification that is taught within that of Hasidus, as taught by Rebbe Nachman of Breslov there. 
Uh, Rabbi Nachman also says that blood is a person's lifeline. Yet the greater the degree of the vitality found in one's body, the greater de uh, the demands of the other side, the sedra achra, to receive nourishment from it. Therefore, a person must not eat blood. So as to not give the sedra achra, the other side, an opportunity to draw vitality from him. Okay? That's the job of the other side, of the sitra achra, of the yatsahara. That is the job of the inner satan. That is the job. The thing is that th there's a, s a song by um, uh, Petra that the one I uh, the one I starve is the one who gives, um, and the one that I feed is the w one who. Um, Oh, I, I forget the lyric. It, it was pertinent, though. <laughs> I just kind of blew that one. But anyway, the one I starve is the one who gives. Okay, that's that's what it is. And the thing is that oftentimes we go and we feed that fleshly desire upon that of our animalistic instinct. And the thing is that we are supposed to suppress and kill the Yetzirah daily. That's what Amalek is. It's the Yetzirah. We have to kill the Yetzirah daily. And we know this from the book of Ereshis of Genesis, where we see that Moshe Rabbeinu, when his arms were up, then, you know, the children of Israel were winning against that of Amalek. When his hands went down, they were losing and all these things. And this is why it is that Hasidus says that Amalek is Yetzirah. Yes, in other places they say that it is also Rome, that it's also Islam later on, and so on and so forth. But the thing that is universal is that at all times, two things can be true, three things can be true. That's the concept of Shevin Panim Latara. But it's also our very own Yetzirah. And that is in every case, it is always our Yetzirah. And we have a quote here from Sephorno, who says, For the soul... Of the flesh. In the blood it is. Because life is dependent upon the blood, God designed blood as the medium that goes upon the altar for atonement, as to say, let one knife life be offered to atone for another. Consequently, it is not appropriate for it to be eating, according to Rashi. The life-giving force in animal is born by blood, which is why blood is the appropriate agent for atonement. Not because God has any desire for blood per se, but because it represents man's dedication of his life to God's service. Now, Rashi and Sephorno said something within here that really I think that many of us don't quite understand in terms of the book of Aikra and all of these various korban that are given. I know that's often translated as sacrifice, but that is not correct. And the thing is that still, at the same time, even if we look at it in its correct context, which is that of an offering, which is what korban really is, is an offering, we say, well, still, we got all these animals being killed and offered up to Hashem. You know, it seems very bloodthirsty and all this stuff. No. Let me explain why that is. The thing is that I am an individual that will always stand up for animals. I hate it when I see people abuse dogs and cats and, you know, their pets and, 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 and other animals. I think it is the most vile thing that a human being can do. Shows really how low their soul is if they are harming an animal. But the thing is that with this, the thing that we have to realize is that when a person would have to bring, for instance, a goat to be made as an offering to Hashem, as a means of rectification, what they would have to do is before they go and bring this goat to the Kohen, they'd be standing next to the Kohen. The person would have to go and take their hands and put their weight upon that of the animal. And they would say, essentially, 
this is my animal. This animal is me. And this is to help a person to understand the graveness of their sins that they have committed. You could think of any animal that it is that you have, whether it be a dog, a cat, a goat, a pot belly pig. I don't know. I don't know what you guys have. But even if the thing is outside and it's done for reasons of a farm or something like that, like you milk a cow or something like that, that animal is still a family member. It's seen by you and your family as more than just an animal. Those things have names. You've, you've given them names. You provide them food. You provide them water. And, you know, they may get excited to see you as, you know, if you go out there and go and do that. Or when you come home, your dogs are, you know, jumping up and down, all excited and all this stuff. Oh, mommy, your daddy's here, you know, and all that. And, and just think about this. Imagine having to take... You know, your, uh, your little shih tzu or something like that. Having to put your hands on this dog that you've had for 10 years and say, I'm going to let them kill you now because of the things that I did. If I didn't do these things, I'm transferring my sin to you. That dog is like... I didn't do these things. You did it. You know, why are you sending me over here? When you think about that and you think about your own pets, the, the animals that you have, you see why this was done. You see what the wages of sin are. The scripture says the wages of sin are death. And we see that it really does mean that. It really does mean that. And it also shows a tried and true dedication to Hashem. You know, if you two had to take your little cocker spaniel or your cat or something like that, and say, sorry, buddy. Got to do this. Got to do this. Whatever it is that you had committed, whatever kind of sin that you had done that would cause you to go and do that, because, you know, many people say, oh, well, you know, the, the, their wealth was in their animals and all that stuff. Man, people who say that have never been around animals. They never have. They don't understand the full emotional impact of offering up essentially a family member. And that also should have us to understand why, how tough it was for Hashem to offer up his son, Yeshua. Think on that. Guys, thank you so much for joining me here today for this week's Parshas, Parshas Sav. We will be back next week, and I believe that we actually have Parshiot next week. I think we have a double portion. Isn't it next week that's Tazria Metzora? Is that right? Is it next week, or is it the week after? I have to look. But um, I will be joining you guys. If it is a double Parshas next week, then there will be two videos, one for Tazria, one for Metzora. Um, being done one day after one another. So if that's the case, and I got a lot to get done tomorrow we, or next week, we got the um, responding to the anti-missionary series. We're going to be going through Isaiah 7 in terms of that, looking at what the anti-missionaries say about that, saying, is it accurate? We'll see. We'll find out. And um, then possibly a double partious, you know, so I'll have a busy week next week if it is. The double partials of Tazri and Metzara. I believe it is. I believe it is. So I, I might need to go and pre-record some of this uh, this weekend or something to kind of. But uh, guys, I want to thank all of you for joining me here today, and uh, make sure to go and go and hit the follow button on Rumble, 
and also make a point to go and um, subscribe on Apple Podcasts and go and check out the website, guitarrabbi.com. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I want to wish you all shalom bracha, peace and a blessing. Shalom.